Um, also, I want to let everyone know there will be a reception uh, immediately after this, uh, following in the DRC2 auditorium, where we'll have a chance to mingle with the speakers and talk to the company people a bit. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Michael Dixon with Unimed. Uh, Unimed is the technology commercialization and development entity here at UNMC. So our goal is to see technologies uh, that are created in the lab developed into products that help improve healthcare. Um, we really recognize that the technology development is a long, expensive process, and so that's why we created the demo day to try to give you, uh, to give everyone a glimpse at some of the hard work and development that's going into creating the technologies of tomorrow. So it, it's a very tedious process, it's a very expensive process, and I think we've got some companies that are just doing an amazing job developing products. And these are really the, the products of the next generation. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing them develop these technologies further. At this point in the day, I'd, I'd actually like to recognize uh, Unimed's business development director, Joe Rungi. Um, so as most of you know, Joe spends most of his days and uh, nights uh, helping to identify, protect, develop university technology. Um, Joe's CV will tell you he's a scientist, a uh, patent attorney, but I've actually found Joe has one of the most astute business minds I've found. He has uh, the ability to get to the bottom of a technology very quickly, understand where that market's at and how that needs to be developed. So I'm really pleased that Joe has stepped up, volunteered to present the next technology. Uh, describing, I think, a, a technology that, that has the chance to, to be the, the base for training for um, one of the fastest growing segments of uh, surgery, that's minimally invasive surgery. So, Joe? Thank you. Heck of a demo day. Um, so, uh, to repeat the introduction completely, my name is Joe Rungi. I am business development manager. Uh, it's generally my goal to help identify uh, new technologies. Uh, while I do have some scientific training of all the technical staff at Unimed, I actually have the least, which tends to put me with projects something like this. I, I tend to have the opportunity to work with things that are a little bit less technically involved. Now, that's not to say that podcast is simple, but it is simplicity, and that's kind of the whole point of it. So, um, generally, what, what podcast is, it is a very, very simple laparoscopic simulator, and we'll unpack that a little bit as our conversation continues. What it is, it's a very needed solution. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that surgical training is really complicated. They don't let just anyone do surgery. You, you have to go through and complete a variety of different types of training. This particular project is focused on what is really one of the most complicated things, which is laparoscopic surgery, and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, surgical residencies have actually reached out to, to me to really identify new solutions. And Part and parcel with that is it's pretty unusual for me to have some of my faculty telling me that I've got this big problem that needs solving and other faculty bringing a solution to me. So that's very interesting. Uh, podcast is very different than the existing market, which we will get into. But it's also an enterprise solution. It's very much a 21st century technology. It has the opportunity to take some of the most compelling business models that are present within uh, the country and apply it to something that traditionally has a very old type of business model, and we'll get into that. So the first thing I want to talk about are work hour changes. Uh, for those of you who are regulars on this campus, you are aware that in uh, 2003, federal regulations stipulated that you can only work residents so much. And while 80 hours a week sounds horrible to most people, it was quite the relief to most residents. Now, I don't want to get into the work hour rules discussion because it is something of a sore topic even to this day, and the extent to which it's used and complied is there. But what it did say is that you only get so much time. And that was a, a huge factor in how residents are trained, because at some point you can't just keep working them. And so what that made, especially in surgery, it, it provided a limit. It, it really encouraged efficiency in surgical training in a way that really hadn't been externally provided as much. So simulation is a, is a big opportunity. There are 246 U.S. surgical residency program. There are approximately 1,500 surgical residents. 90% of them use some form of simulation, and each of them have a fairly impressive simulation budget. There is an established market there which is looking for new simulation opportunities. So um, that's backwards. There we go. So Laparoscopic surgery is essentially minimally invasive surgery. It's where instead of cutting someone open, you basically stick a tool through a little hole. That hole is called a trocar. 
You then inflate someone's abdomen up with inert gas, and you stick a camera in there. And instead of having to make a big incision in someone, you can essentially do surgery through a little incision. There's a huge effort to do as many surgeries, minimally invasive, as possible. There's efficiency savings in that people recover faster. There's a lower risk of infection. And generally, patients uh, have better outcomes rather than sort of cutting them open in the traditional way. The problem is laparoscopic surgery is really, really hard. You can't see what you're doing except on this flat screen. And so surgeons, and this is something that impresses me to this day about surgeons, they have encyclopedic understanding of anatomy. They have an implicit, almost spiritual understanding of, of the neck bone connecting to the thigh bone or however that goes. And when you put them in a laparoscopic environment, you deprive them of that. They now have this flat environment in which they are looking at these little robotic tools in which they are doing those operations. You are fundamentally putting a surgeon, a very well-trained individual, into a very different environment. That makes training for laparoscopic surgery really complicated because you have to take that understanding of anatomy that you've sort of driven into people in their early medical and early residency training and really get them to understand that in a totally different environment. So that basically has created a market for what are laparoscopic simulators. Laparoscopic simulators come in a lot of different varieties, but I'm coarsely describing them in, in two forms. Uh, laparoscopic boxes, which are essentially these sort of analog devices where you have a camera. That camera can be displayed on a computer, but that computer is simply displaying what's inside the box, right? What's in the box. Uh, and, and so you're only looking at your tools there and seeing sort of what's coming out there. Then there are more complicated 3D simulators. They are computer-controlled simulators. They've got these sort of complex mechanical uh, laparoscopic tools that essentially drive a very, very complicated video game, which is essentially displayed up on here. Now, these cost a couple thousand dollars. These cost many, many thousands of dollars. But both of them have you know, been on the market for a substantial amount of time. And it really kind of shows the two different aspects of, of surgical training. The first one is basic skills, right? This is the one you use essentially to learn how to pick up something through a laparoscopic simulator. This is one in which you actually try to learn how to do a surgical procedure, but they're very different instruments. So a very inventive group of, of people on campus, and, and we'll get to them in a minute, basically took all the function of the more complicated device but made something that's actually simpler than the simple device. And they did it using relatively simple components. And I, I apologize for the crude drawing there. But really all the podcast is is using cameras to track existing laparoscopic tools. Now, it took me a long time to understand the true importance of this innovation. Because there's lots of things that actually measure the amount of movement of laparoscopic tools. But what this actually creates is a three-dimensional path that that tool takes all throughout the course of the simulation. Now, what that can do then is have a other path that's optimal for the particular simulation already in mind, and then compare them. So what you can do is imagine this instrument, right? And I'm sorry, I, I could have put a picture of this, but I, I want you to imagine it. And imagine it hooked up to a computer that's over here. The computer simulates something simple, right? You're sticking little pegs or little uh, uh, beads onto a system of pegs. It can essentially measure your efficiency in doing it because it's watching your entire procedure. It's then transmitting that as a series of three-dimensional coordinates to a computer. What that gives you is the ability to do exactly this, only instead of spending tens of thousands of dollars, you're spending several hundred dollars to be able to produce it. But more importantly, it is very capable to essentially take this same instrument, sorry, the same simulator, and instead of just connecting it to a computer, connect it through the computer to a series of internet-based applications. What that would allow you to be able to do is to download a different type of simulation. It could be different colored pegs and different colored beads. Or it could essentially be a more complex simulation of a surgical procedure. But instead of having to have those two different instruments, those two different big devices, you have one device that is inexpensive enough for a surgical resident to take with them wherever they can go. They can plug it into the computer in the computer lab to do some of their simulation during the day. They can plug it into their computer at home to do it during the night. Now, these are essentially representatives of some of the analytics that are listed here. These are all the different space and track of the tools as they move through three-dimensional space and as they're measured against the types of outcomes that the simulator is pushing the trainee towards. And again, it really allows for not just measurement of progress, but it can also create real-time feedback. It could say, 
hey, surgeon, you're doing this inefficiently or you're doing this unsteadily. You need to work on this aspect. But more importantly, it can send that directly to the person who's training the resident to say, resident X is mastering task three but is having difficulty with task four. Here are some potential interventions. So it's a feature-rich solution for everyone. It takes all the aspects of the expensive simulators, but really breaks them down to a simulator that is the unthinkable to residency directors, where every resident has their own simulator. They could do it at their own pace, and they could be encouraged to do it through all the ways in which you get online systems to encourage people to participate. More importantly, it provides real-time analysis, feedback, and evaluation. It tells the resident what they're doing wrong, it tells their director what they're doing wrong, and it tells them what they're doing right. Surgeons, and you're going to be surprised by this, are slightly competitive. And so I think if you provided some way in which they could measure themselves against each other, it may create a tear in the fabric of reality of all the effort that they would put into it. It's a way in which you can use the existing mechanisms by which we encourage people to play online games to learn to become better surgeons. I think I have the same slide twice. Nope. It just looks the same. So. The goal is to essentially, by tracking tool position in real time, to provide real time mechanisms to evaluate those skills and create a robust simulation in which they can evaluate it. Now, the team that produced this is very illustrative of the underlying philosophy of it. Uh, Dr. Joseph Su is a, uh, he's the director of the Center for Advanced Surgical Technology, but he's also a professor of physical therapy, and he focuses on human movement. And it's really cool to have two presentations related to human movement, because we're really at an era in which computers have caught up to our ability to understand how human beings work. Carl Nelson, uh, when he's not pretending to be in space, is a uh, professor of engineering and Lincoln. He's a mechanical engineer. He's a PE, which is actually not common amongst academic engineers. He has a long history of working with us to sort of build these types of devices. And what we've really been able to do is establish this sort of proof of principle for these types of platforms. We also have been working for a long time with a local video game development studio. They developed some mock-ups for us for these types of developments and have really worked with us to figure out how you can take the various mechanisms by which video game developers get you to keep playing video games to get surgical residents to keep working on their simulation. Finally, we're in talks with a number of partners to essentially develop this as a platform to build an online presence, a, 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 a network-based solution that we could deploy across all of these different types of simulators to really change the way in which simulation is done, to change it from a capital investment to a service that we provide not only to the residents, but also to the residents, the directors. And that is all. Do you have any questions? Thank you much.